I will ask our secretary to call the roll. <laughs> Chairman Thompson? Present. Vice Chair Walt Curry? That was the Glenn Bailey. Oh, that's right. You're right. I saw it. You are. Um, Walt Curry? Jay Nelson? Dr. Banks? Here. Dr. Glamers? Here. Mr. Gestern? Here. Thank you. We will rise and thank you lead into the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. As we uh, begin our meeting, thank you for being here. Guests are welcome. This is indeed a, a public meeting. It is not a public hearing. And while you are here to uh, watch, hear what goes on, uh, this uh, will be a public meeting and no public comment will be uh, received at, at this meeting. I do have quite a uh, stack of public comment that has been written and that we go through very carefully. Okay. Uh, if uh, I'll try to speak loud enough so you can all hear me, yes. and the the first item on our agenda would be the consent agenda, and today this is the approving of the minutes of the August 27, 2020. Good afternoon. Meeting. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Jay Nelson as executive. There are the division reports and there are three con uh, contracts. Are, is there anything from the consent agenda that any board member wishes to pull for further comment or question? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would move that we approve the consent agenda as written. All right, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Do I hear a second? I would second. Moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the consent agenda is approved as presented. The next item on our program today First, I'm going to introduce uh, our director, Laura, and she is going to introduce our presenter, who's going to give us a program update on diabetes education and prevention program. Laura. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, pleased uh, to uh, present to you Kim Young. Kim uh, has been with the health district for how many years now, Kim? Since 2013, since 2013. Um, she holds a master's in family and consumer sciences um, from the University of Idaho. She um, is a program manager for um, uh, uh, our WIC program as well as some of our public health services program programs. She was recently, um, her diabetes education prevention program was, was accredited, which is a, a, a phenomenal um, um, thing uh, and I'm so pleased that uh, that she has led this effort and um, she's here to tell us about it. Thank you, Kim. Thank you.
director stated, I have been with Panhandle since 2013, and believe it or not, this accreditation um, actually we started in 2014 gathering all our documents. So this is definitely an amazing achievement, and we are excited to offer this service. So just a little bit of facts about diabetes, um, and specifically in Idaho. But diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in Idaho. An estimated 10.2% across Idaho has diabetes, with an estimated 6.6% being within our five northern um, counties. And according to the CDC, about 35% of the adults do have prediabetes, which increases their risk of getting diabetes. And nine out of 10 of those people with prediabetes don't even know they have prediabetes, and that's a scary thing. So improper management of diabetes um, may lead to serious complications and even death, and also direct medical costs associated with diabetes is over $334 million. So that's per year, and that's based on uh, medications, appointments, um, supplies, insulin, et cetera. All right, so we do have a need in our community. We do have a prevalence of diabetes. Um, education is definitely needed for prevention and management of type two and gestational diabetes. And gestational would be uh, those pregnant women with the higher elevated blood sugars. There is no known prevention for type one at this time. The community health assessment that was performed here in 2018 revealed that access to care is a health priority, which is identified in our health community our community health improvement plan as one of our priority areas that we're addressing. Um, so in 2018, another reason why we felt we had a need is that Kootenai Health actually approached us and we've been collaborating with uh, Kootenai Health Skyview and Endocrinology. Um, and we've been talking to them about the need for help with referrals. They've been really backed up with referrals. Um, and so they're the only other uh, DSVS, which that's what stands, that's our acronym for Diabetes Self-Management Education. Um, they're the only other ones that are accredited and actually they're recognized through American Diabetes Association. And in 2020, so just recently, Bonner General Health, their DSMS program dissolved um, due to some funding concerns. So why is accreditation and recognition valuable? And first of all, I'm just going to point out those two pictures there. That was on our um, diabetes screening day, which is November 14th, every year that occurs. And we held a diabetes screening day in conjunction with all of our partners, community partners um, at Kootenai Health. And so we had, um, there's a lot of partners there. We had uh, another endocrinologist, Dr. Lyko, um, some other healthcare providers, a vision provider, um, everything that would affect diabetes um, screening. And so that's just a, an example of our, our table there that we had set up. And then Eat Smart Idaho, which is University of Idaho Extension. They're one of our partners that were there. And, dietetic students and they provided some cooking skills and some samples at last year's event. So. Um, but accreditation and recognition is valuable because one, we can now build Medicare. Medicare has standards that we have to meet and in order to be accredited, we meet those 10 standards that Medicare um, says we need to meet in order to build them. And not only that, it defines our quality program because we are meeting those standards. It also assists our educators with evidence-based diabetes education. And in turn, we have improved clinical outcomes and quality of life. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through these standards and the documentation. Um, I will try not to bore you with every single detail of the standards, but just give you an overview of what we needed to do to gather all this information to be accredited. So standard one was to define our mission and our goals and receive organizational support, which we did. So our mission statement is to empower PhD clients with the self-care management skills necessary to improve their quality of life using what they have learned through diabetes education and disease management. Our goals are to impact the lives of PhD clients through the services that we provide, to enable clients to take charge of their health and healthcare through interactive and individualized education self-management coaching and empowerment, and also to provide current evidence-based education in an open and conducive environment, and to become the medium of a healthcare change to the community in which we serve. 
All right, so we'll go quickly through standards two through six, but standards two is stakeholder input. That's um, required to seek ongoing input from valued stakeholders, and it's also very important um, because we want them to provide input of how we can make things better, how we can improve our services. So we do hold advisory group meetings uh, quarterly. I think it's required, the requirement's really every six months, but we do it quarterly. Um, we do check-ins with our partners, um, provide surveys, see how we're doing. Standard three is evaluation of our population served. So we gather all the demographic data, uh, mainly through secondary data, and then um, also gathered resources and also what we identified as barriers to access. So whether that's transportation, a lot of our counties are rural, um, that underinsured or uninsured, uh, those types of things. Standard four identifies the quality coordinator overseeing the BSME services. Um, I am the quality coordinator. So I had to reflect on my resume or my curriculum vitae that I um, have the qualifications to manage a program. Um, and I also must document 15 continuing education credits that I obtained annually regarding diabetes. So making sure that I am up to date on all the diabetes education. Um, standard five is identifying your team members. So up at the top there is basically our team right now. We have Tracy Begg, who is a WIC dietitian. She's also um, our certified diabetes educator. And then that's me, that's her, obviously. Um, and she, she actually was a diabetes educator prior to coming here to Panhandle. And then she's a, a wonderful WIC dietitian as well. Um, so it just made sense. And she sees our diabetes patients. Um, documentation must be that we have at least one dietitian or a registered nurse or a pharmacist, um, or they hold the CDCES credential, which is the Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist credential, and that is what Tracy has. Um, and then we must document that she is continually holding that or that she's obtaining 15 CEs um, annually. Standard six identifies our curriculum. So our curriculum must have documentation that we are including all of those core components um, so it's evidence-based curriculum, which we did purchase curriculum through our accrediting body. And those core components that we addressed are healthy eating, physical activity, medication usage, how to monitor blood sugars, healthy coping, um, so providing that support or referring them out, problem solving, and reducing their risks of other complications. Um, so we can use this curriculum in group settings and individual appointments. And this is how we base a lot of their behavioral goal, um, goals on for these, these areas, these seven areas. Okay, so standard seven through nine. Um, in order to be accredited, we had to have at least one patient go through. We did have more than that, but we have to have at least one patient go through and provide the de-identified patient chart showing that we include all the components that are required. So standard seven, they want to see that we've done an individual assessment um, of their health status, psychosocial adjustments, their learning level, their lifestyle practices, um, anything like that. Um, and then ongoing education, we had to show that we have ongoing education planning, the behavior goal setting, which is surrounded by those seven areas in the previous slide. Um, and then we also have to show that we followed up based on that individual's needs. And then standard eight is the ongoing self-management support options in the community that with participants preference noted. So we have a resource list, referrals out if there's something that's beyond our scope of, of practice, then we would utilize that resource list. We would find out what they, what their preference would be, whether it's a walking group for physical activity, something that might help them address their goals. And standard nine, uh, we must have at least one specific goal, so the SMART goal, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, realistic, and timely behavioral goal with follow-up and measured achievement. And then documentation of at least one clinical outcome. So has their A1C decreased? Um, how is their BMI, which is based on their uh, height and weight, um, to measure the effectiveness of the education? And then also uh, the communication back to the referring provider of the education provided and their the, the participants' outcomes. So 
It's really important to note that when we have someone referred to our program, that we are always collaborating with the referring provider, and it's not our intent to then take that, that patient and have them stay with us the whole time. We wanna make sure that they are going back to their provider so that they can um, set further goals. So they can, um, we just make sure that we have collaboration and care with the provider. And then standard 10, the last standard, um, is quality improvement. So we must document that we are collecting aggregate data for analysis so that we can show clinical, behavioral, and process outcomes. So we collect that through our electronic medical records, um, their chart, we use spreadsheets to document that. And then we use continuous quality improvement uh, measuring the effectiveness. So the plan, view, study, act, PDSA cycle is what we are currently using. The aim statement that we most recently came up with is for PhD DSMS will increase the number of referrals from 17 that we had last year um, up to 30 by next June of 2021. And so we did hold a stakeholder survey in February and it revealed that there was a lack of awareness of our program. And then also patients lack of insurance identified as a barrier to referring. That is one thing that sets us apart um, is that we are able to work with individuals based on their eligibility and income and use a sliding fee scale um, and, and help them receive the services that they need. Um, again, reducing that uh, barrier to access. Um, so, because we realize that there's a lack of awareness of our program, we are going to be developing a marketing plan to include social media, newspapers, um, in-person meetings when we can, with providers' offices, doing follow-ups, um, possibly with branding the name of our program. And then also, um, we would like to identify, we're in the process of identifying healthcare providers that would like to work with us to assess their current referral process, and we'd love to assist them with coming up with a streamlined process to identify patients with diabetes and even pre-diabetes so that they can refer them out to the correct program that we offer here at the Health District. So with that, since 2014, um, and reason being, um, I had started working on this in 2014, and then um, moved, my duties then moved over into the WIC department, and then there was another dietitian that had come in and was starting to work on it, and it finally made it back into my lap, which I was so excited because it's a passion of mine. Um, so we finally became accredited on July 6, 2020. So, yay! <laughs> um, and so our main site is Hayden, um, and then we have our community sites, um, which are Kellogg, St. Mary's, Bonners Ferry, and Sandpoint. So all of our outer clinics are our community sites. So my hope for the future is to keep expanding so that we can reach those, um, those individuals in those counties. We also, um, you know, the exciting thing right now um, is that we are able to reach a lot of people with telehealth. Um, so we are able to reach those in the other counties um, at, this, at this moment. So I just wanted to point you to other resources that uh, Panhandle offers or that we offer here. So in addition to our DSMS program, we have Diabetes Prevention Program. This is a CDC-recognized lifestyle change program. It's 12 months in length. It focuses on behavior change to prevent type 2 diabetes. Um, we are currently holding cohorts uh, here in Hayden and also in Sandpoint. And then also with our Diabetes, Stroke, and Heart Disease Prevention subgrant that we have, um, new this year is that we will be providing health screenings at community outreach and promotion events. Um, and so blood pressure, BMI, A1C, lipids, um, fats, and triglycerides. Um, and based on those screenings, then we can refer individuals to healthy lifestyle programs or the primary care providers, whichever is most appropriate, based on their screening results. Um, a newer program that we have, we're actually going to be getting cohort three here soon, is Parents Leading Active Youth, and that's our play program. This is actually a 12 week program that is aimed at overweight and obese children between the ages of six and 10. So we are hitting that lower um, age range to really prevent obesity into adulthood and the chronic disease. We're trying to, to reach them early. This uh, focuses on the behavior change for long lasting habits, um, includes, like I said, 12, week, 12 weeks in length with physical activity and nutrition. It includes the whole family. So not just the child, but we want a parent 
we feel them to, to join in as well. And then, of course, women, infants, and children. Um, this is a supplemental nutrition program providing healthy foods, and we provide nutrition education and counseling. We have several uh, dietitians on staff. Um, we have breastfeeding support and uh, referrals to other community resources um, as needed. And so that is also another prevention program that we have here at Community Health District. So with that, that is the end of my presentation. Any questions? Any okay, questions from the board? Dr. Rick Flanders. Uh, just a comment. Thank you, Kim, for all of your work. Uh, just from a regional standpoint, uh, diabetes is a big deal. We, we see dozens of patients with diabetes every day, every week in our clinic alone. And diabetes type 2 is treatable, actually preventable, with uh, lifestyle modification, i.e., what do you eat and how do you exercise? And so I just dialed into the American Diabetes Association that the most recent stats are that the cost of treating diabetes in the U.S. in 2017, uh, $327 billion. So thank you. Well, thank you. We're excited for the question. Glenn, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just had a uh, comment and, and a question. Kim, congratulations on being accredited. That's, thank you. that's outstanding. Um, being retired military, do you know whether or not TRICARE will fund your program? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't. Be because I know a lot of military <laughs> retirees would be borderline like myself as far as the, the, the sugar content, et cetera, et cetera. I just had a, a physical from my doctor and he didn't mention anything about this. He said, continue your exercise program, watch your intake of, of sugars, et cetera, et cetera. So there's those preventative measures that we can take. Absolutely. But I know that a lot of people would benefit from a program like yours, the pre-diabetes program. And especially our current concern right now is the COVID-19 issues. And uh, diabetes is a major contributing factor to people actually dying from this. You know, the, the diabetes, the lung, uh, chronic lung issues, uh, those are definitely something that people need to be aware of because the majority of the people that are dying from the COVID have a comorbidity. It's only 6%, as I understand it, are dying from the COVID itself alone. Now, that's a minuscule number of that 200,000 people in the U.S. who have died from the COVID-19. So we need to make people aware. Watch your diabetes. Watch your other diseases, your heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Because if you have those factors, you definitely need to be taking precautions. So. Yeah, the, the diabetes, our CDC recognized program um, also does take Medicare for that program. And as far as TRICARE, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be up to individual insurances. We're, we're still working on um, all the different insurances and knowing who covers what. We always refer the um, individual to check into their insurance to see what they cover, right. what it covers for sure. Um, but yes, that is something that we're, we're really new with. But there are private insurances that do cover the, pre, the diabetes prevention program as well. So right. and your, your public relations effort, please get the word out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, Jay, do you have any questions or comments? All right, Commissioner Mike, uh, do you have any questions or comments? They lost audio. Um, can you check and see? We have a big partial one that has audio on something. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Kim. It's always a delight to have you come and that report is forward. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your work and congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. All right. <laughs> um, let's just uh, take a, a moment to bring the audio back.
right. We're on the break temporarily. Commissioner Mike, uh, Ms. Gerald, can you hear me? Can you give us a thumbs up if you can? Okay. He either can't hear us or he lost his thumb. What is the shared screen? We got their videos. Why don't we Jay Nelson, can you hear me? I can hear you now, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. You're, you're back with us, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're asking questions. Uh, if you have any questions for Kim on her diabetes report, first, Jay, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, not at this time. Thank you, Kim. That was a great report. All right, Commissioner Fitzgerald, do you have any questions or comments for our diabetes presenter? Uh, no questions, uh, just a very uh, warm thank you for all the work you do. All right, we will move on then. And I'll call on our... Director, would you like to uh, introduce our next presenter? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm pleased to bring you our COVID-19 update um, presented by Jeff Lee, um, the program manager for our epidemiology program. Jeff holds a uh, master's um, in business um, in, health and, and in health administration. Um, we're so very fortunate to have him. Um, also, I am um, pleased to bring you, and Jeff will introduce her. Um, uh, with the state and national perspective on COVID, Dr. Chris Kahn, who is our state epidemiologist. But we'll start with a local update, Jeffrey. Good afternoon. Um, just going to start with uh, a local update. This, these numbers are as of this morning. Um, right now, we're at almost 3,300 cases in the five northern counties. Uh, Benoit County accounts for about 4.2%, almost 10% of the cases in Bonner County, under 2% in Boundary, and um, almost 7% in Shoshone County. The rest of the cases are, have occurred in Kootenai County. This is actually not far from each of the counties represent the percentage of our population. Um, relatively evenly split between men and women. A um, little more uh, on the female side. Uh, but this is not consistent throughout the counties, uh, just in our overall numbers. This one might be hard for you to see. These are five-year age groups. What um, I'd like to point out is if you go down to the 20 to 25, 30 to 35-year age groups, you'll see that they um, represent the largest group uh, of in, you know, any of the age groups for uh, the number of cases. Uh, since school has started, we are watching um, the 5 to 19 year old age groups for any increases. We have not seen anything significant yet at this point. Uh, age, or case by distribution, race distribution. Um, a majority of the cases obviously are white, followed by um, Asian, Black, Alaskan Native, Pacific Islander, um, other and unknown um, 
make up more than one in five of the cases. If you're wondering why the total here is not consistent with our total number of cases, um, capturing race and ethnicity data uh, didn't start occurring until a little bit later uh, in the pandemic that we started uh, back in March. And so we haven't had a chance to go back and update those previous case records. Looking at hospitalizations, there have been 198 cases to date. That represents a 6% hospitalization rate. So when we are doing uh, forecasting, working with a hospital, that would be our, the coefficient that we're using, 6% of cases in the future would probably need hospitalization. That helps them to determine the number of beds they might need. There's also a proportion of those that would need uh, critical care and potentially ventilation. Deaths to date, uh, we have 57. That's a, a, a case fatality ratio of 1.7. That's a little under the 2% that we would see in a bad pandemic year with influenza at this point in time not a seasonal uh, number, a bad pandemic. This is the uh, epi curve for the cases we've received since our very first case back in uh, March, uh, around the 15th of March. Uh, as you can see, we dropped down uh, fairly recently, about uh, mid-August, mid the number of cases coming in dropped down but about the first week of September, they started climbing again. And that trend seems to continue to go on at this point in time. We're seeing correlating uh, markers in other areas that I'll be showing you. This is a seven day running average for the incidence rate. Incidence rate is a uh, statistic that is developed by using the populations of each of the counties as a denominator so that we can compare them directly. Otherwise, uh, 10 cases in Kootenai County would not affect this much, but 10 cases in Benoit County would affect it, would it indicate a large disease burden on that community. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, per 100,000 population. Right now, uh, everybody is pretty much below uh, what we would consider to be the moderate level, they're in the minimal level, which is 15 cases per 100,000 and uh, below. And each of the counties is represented by a different color. What we are seeing though in our largest counties, uh, Bonner and Kootenai, is a continuing upward trend in that uh, uh, incidence rate. This is positivity, one of our other metrics that we're using. Um, this is from the Kootenai Health, primarily from the, their testing site at the 2207 building. As you can see in um, July and August, we had quite a few, uh, a, a quite high positivity rate up above 14%. Um, around the uh, Beginning of September, it had dropped down and was actually below 4%. Um, but in the recent uh, days, it has started climbing again. What the positivity rate uh, represents is the proportion of all tests that were positive. Uh, we want to be able to, again, measure uh, apples to apples. And so um, for each day, we take the total number of tests divide into it the total number of positives, that gives us the positivity rate. We can then directly compare day over day. And what we're seeing here is an increase in the number of positive tests, and that's not reliant on the total number of tests that are done. And then the, from the state, they take all of the lab reports that we receive from laboratories that provide both positive and negative numbers of tests performed and they uh, do the same thing. They develop a positivity rate based on that. And there's 
uh, last couple of weeks, um, we started to see that climb again. For uh, as of the end of last week, we were at just below eight percent on the positivity rate. This is delayed a week. They they publish it once a week, and it's usually for the preceding week. Jeff, got a question? Yes, sir. The testing. That's not mandatory anywhere that I'm aware of. So this is all voluntarily individuals coming in to be tested for the PCR uh, using the pet PCR test. Um, yes, I, I would agree voluntarily to an extent, but they don't, they can't do it without a physician's order. So okay. this is based on a recommendation from their physicians to get tested. So they've had, they have indicators that they may have the COVID, therefore they cases. come in, is mm -hmm. that, is that what's prompting them? Um, or they've been recommended to get tested because they have a significant exposure to somebody with COVID-19. Okay. I mean, not yet be um, symptomatic, uh, but unfortunately what we're learning is that there is a, a fairly significant portion of the infected population that remains asymptomatic or they may be spreading it before they develop symptoms or what we call pre-symptomatic. Comment. So, Comment. Um, I know at least one person, and I suspect there are more, who in order to be able to go on a fishing trip on Kodiak Island had to be tested for COVID-19 before they would allow him to get on the airplane, actually to allow him to get off the airplane in Alaska. So there are people that are involuntarily getting this test. Well, it's voluntary in a way. If they want to go fishing, they have to be tested. Uh, but um, it's uh, what are the conditions for this? What are the conditions of it to be able to go? So, so there is some involuntary testing at least. I, I would disagree, sir. That that's involuntary, as you pointed out. They want to go fishing. That's just the rule set by Alaska. So. As far as the PCR test itself, how is the reliability of it as far as false positives, et cetera? Do you know what that rate is right now? Sure. The, um, when we talk about false positives and false negatives, those uh, numbers are determined by what's called the sensitivity and specificity of those tests. Um, for a false positive, what you what would usually happen is you would have a low specificity. You know, it's it's not looking specifically for the COVID-19 genome in the test. But the PCR tests are at between 97 and 99% on their specificity. Uh, unfortunately, their sensitivity is not that high. And sensitivity is what is used to calculate the negative predictive value or the chance of having a false negative. Okay. And since the specificity is high, the sensitivity is low, what we're more worried about is having a false negative, which can occur because first off, there has to be a certain amount of DNA available for the test to um, detect. Register. Right. And so that doesn't occur um, immediately. It takes a couple of days for it to get up to the level of the test sensitivity. And then there is a period of time where the, the sensitivity is high enough that it reduces the risk of false negatives um, by about uh, between uh, 80, 70 and 80%, where there's a 20% chance at the lowest point of getting a false negative. And that occurs around day eight after exposure about 38% chance of false negative at day five. And day nine, it starts to go back up. So that's why we recommend a five to eight or five to nine day uh, period after somebody is exposed so that we reduce the probability of getting a false negative. But it was my understanding that people become most infective of others from day four through day eight, correct? That it, in the mean, that can happen. Uh, okay. Not everybody is going to follow that pattern. 
that's again we're dealing with with probabilities there's always going to be outliers um, we ex we consider people to be infectious about 24 to uh, 48 hours prior to the onset of their symptoms doesn't help us much when we're dealing with asymptomatic people and there are also pre-symptomatic people who are contagious so around that day four they could be contagious that's why we ask them to stay home if they've been significantly exposed we're just asking them to delay testing until that window where we can reduce the probability of a false negative occurring okay but at the same time as we see the number of cases identified through the testing etc increasing but the mortality rate is not increasing. In fact, it is flatlined and pretty steady low, correct? It, uh, it has been down, and that's a good thing. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm very happy we're not seeing deaths like we may have seen if, at the very beginning. But that's because um, the medical science, the treatment modalities, have improved. Has improved. You know, correct. We're eight months in. To, to the the pandemic and you know we, well, that's, we know that's one of the twice as much as we know one of the in. factors that may have reduced it okay understand there's there, it's a dynamic situation and there are a lot of variables that that go into that but um we are improving our our treatment modalities uh, we're finding out what works what doesn't work that's a good thing hmm. Question. Thank you. Question. Sure. Um, so, if I understood you correctly, people are infective before they're symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's true of flu too. If that's true, then uh, symptomatic means coughing and sneezing, correct? Or loss of taste and sense of smell. Uh, diarrhea, headaches, sore throat, all, all of the potential symptoms of COVID-19. So people could be infective and not be symptomatic. And so that would make one wonder what good a mask is if they aren't coughing or sneezing, but they're still infectious. Well, that's why we recommend that people wear masks whenever they're out in public, regardless of whether they have COVID-19 or not. That doesn't seem logical to me. Well, okay. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Uh, should we call for a question from uh, our board we, members? Uh, we have one more presenter, Dr. Christine Hahn. She is our state epidemiologist. She's a board certified infectious disease doctor. She graduated the Epidemic Investigative Services School at the CDC. And I've had the pleasure of working with her for the last 20 years. Uh, Dr. Hahn, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great. And I don't know if Jill is going to be running the slides. Should I just shout, her, uh, shout out when I um, get the slides move forward? We're going to give us a second to get that set yep. up. Chris. Okay, well, while you're getting it set up, okay, thank you, Jeff, and thank you for that great presentation, and, and thank you, uh, board members, for the good questions. Uh, one thing that uh, we always emphasize and uh, uh, is that this is a virus that we are learning a lot about as we go, unfortunately. Usually when we come and we talk about whether it's measles or it's uh, pertussis or TB, We've had years and years and years of evidence and data to study, and this is, even though we have other coronaviruses we've studied and, and people are have information on, this is a new virus and we are very, I think, humble in our, in our knowledge and lack thereof, um, and also um, working very hard as each, I think every day I get about 10 new uh, journal articles sent to me uh, that I try to at least skim, if not read thoroughly, um, and also, um, as many of you are, I'm sure, keeping up on um, information coming out through, um, like, University of San Francisco is very good about putting out information, obviously, John Hopkins, Harvard, CDC, the World Health Organization. So, um, on the one hand, we're humble in our, in our that this, there's a lot about this virus we don't know yet, or that we will change, probably have to change information about, but on the other hand, we're also 
working really hard to stay up to date and there is tons of information coming out all the time. Um, so anyway, thank you for inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate it. Um, please, uh, like you did Jeff, please stop me with questions. I don't claim to know everything about this virus, but um, uh, as Jeff mentioned, I have worked in public health. I came, came to Idaho in 1995 as part of the CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service. Prior to that, I trained in infectious diseases at Duke University. And um, uh, so I do have a uh, background in this type of this field of study, but this is a new virus for us all. So, and my first pandemic, other than in 2009, which would seem super easy to hear to this. Uh, all right, uh, next slide, please. So just to start off, just a reminder, refresher of where we're at. Um, this is the national trend. Um, the nationwide um, saw uh, this the peak in the spring, and really it never went kind of back to baseline. Um, as you see, and as you're aware, in Idaho, we had a little bit of a better kind of a, a drop than over the early summer. But nationwide, if you look at the nation as a whole, they did not see that. And with the second wave, things have been looking really, really good, uh, but I want to put the right arrow there to draw your attention to the last few weeks. So what Jeff just showed you for your health district, um, and I'll show you for the state, um, we are worried that we're already starting to see an uptick in cases, um, despite weeks and weeks now of good news, declining case counts, declining percent positivity, that is unfortunately turning around uh, in Idaho and in the nation. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So one question that comes up a lot is how serious is this disease? And again, we are learning as we go. It is changing. As you guys have already talked about, the, there are questions about whether the mortality, the case mortality rate, we know that among reported cases, the mortality rate is declining both nationwide and in Idaho. For the spring wave in Idaho, among reported cases, we had about a 2% fatality rate. So the cases we knew about it, about 2% of them died with this fall wave so far, we're at about one point, I think it's about 1.5% right now. So we are seeing a drop in our, among cases that we're aware of, of those that die. Um, and there are, as already got, we already talked about a little bit, um, many potential reasons for that. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, you can see here the hospitalization numbers nationwide, and you can see there, again, the two waves, but you'd expect the second wave to look a lot bigger uh, compared to what you just saw for case count. So again, uh, hopefully we're learning uh, partly people seem to be getting milder infections and we can talk about that probably, probably similar to why we're seeing lower fatality rates. We're seeing more infections in younger people who may not need to be hospitalized. Um, we know better how to manage some of these patients, hopefully as an outpatient, et cetera. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a little more uh, talking about the hospitalization. You guys are well aware uh, that older individuals, this is uh, broken down by age group, and you can see the black dashed line there is the um, highest rate of hospitalization in that age group is 65 and older, and it really marches right down that age range where the next lowest um, rate of hospitalization is in people in their 50s, and then you go down to young adults in 18 to 4, I consider 18 to 49 young adults now. Um, and, uh, and then again, children, the lowest hospitalization rate of all, but certainly not zero. Uh, next slide. So um, well, how about people that end up in the hospital? Um, as, we, as we're well aware, we hear this a lot, you know, well, gee, it's the folks who are older, it's the folks who are sick. And I hope that's not reassuring to any of us because the, the, the fact is that many, many Americans and Idahoans have these conditions. Uh, and they, for example, uh, hypertension, diabetes. We just heard a really nice presentation on all the work in diabetes. We, and we've heard that 10% of Idahoans are, have diabetes and then a large percent have prediabetes. Uh, and diabetes comes up over and over again uh, when we look at the folks that we have in Idaho in the hospital and the folks who are dying. Cardiovascular disease, obesity, chronic kidney disease, very common conditions in people who are hospitalized. Um, about uh, people who get hospitalized almost Chris, we can't hear you. You lose our connection? 
um, maybe we stop sharing the screen for a minute. Chris, can you hear us? I've got it on the phone. Hey, you lost your audio. Yeah, we lost your lost your audio. Um, yeah, we can put the slides up. Can you put the slides back up? Can you put her on conference call and come over to the microphone? Then we can. Um, I'm gonna. Yeah, just put her on speakerphone, and then you can put her on the microphone. I'm, I'm just going to have you do the audio through the phone. Is that okay? Mr. Chairman, yeah. can I ask if uh, Commissioner Fitzgerald and Jay Nelson can hear us? Sure. Jill? Oh, Jill? Uh, no, Jared's running. He's our IT tech. So I'm just going to push on speakerphone, okay? Okay. okay, Chris, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. And if uh, Eric is working on the audio for the... Yeah, the speaker. What? Can you guys hear me now? There we go. Yes. Okay. All right. You don't, you don't need the phone. We heard her over the speaker. Oh, okay. Okay. We're back. okay, I'm going to hang you up. I'll find a good job. Jeff, let's get this work. Okay, bye. Okay. Are we back in, back in business? Okay, thank you. And, and yeah, I don't, what happened there? Something else gone. Um, yeah, we were just talking about the severe outcomes and just a reminder. I think I don't know if this. I think this got cut off right as I was making this point. These data are sobering. Also, they're from that first wave, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, um, uh, things are changing with this virus. But this is what uh, was just published uh, from, from patients from the first wave. Um, okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. So here, this is one of the slides I wanted to talk about. Uh, when we talk about the severity, it is really, really hard to get your head around it. Um, we've had all sorts of questions about how death certificates are completed and are some people dying with COVID instead of of COVID and all sorts of things. And I just wanted to, this data to me, this is from the CDC website uh, from the National Vital Statistics System. And it is to me the clearest illustration I can think of to talk about the excess deaths that have been seen in this country. So what this is, is this is all deaths reported. This does it. So if you are concerned that physicians or coroners are reporting deaths that are really due to something else and they're actually calling them COVID deaths, this will take, this should eliminate that concern because these are all deaths reported. The green bars represent, uh, so those are all historical through the 2017, and you can see that little peak there in around January of 2018 on the left side of your slide. And that is the peak that, um, that was a bad, what we call a bad flu season. So you can see those pluses mean those are weeks in which the case, the deaths were higher than expected based on that orange line being sort of the number, the usual number of deaths that we see every year in this country and a little bit of a wave-like pattern as deaths increase in the winter months. So that was a bad flu year. We were talking earlier, I think, about what's a bad flu year. That was a bad flu year. It was 20, 27, 2018, and some of you may remember that. Whereas 2019, 2018-19 uh, really didn't look so bad. Um, and then coming up to the far right of your screen here, you can see uh, the blue um, bars are deaths that were attributed to COVID-19. 
Um, and those are real deaths. Those are deaths that have been reported. So this country has seen an increase in deaths overall. So whether you or not you believe um, they were due to COVID-19 at all, you have to, I think, agree that there has been a sudden increase that continues um, in overall deaths in this country. Uh, next slide. So the other thing I want to mention about severity is that there is some data now. We don't have a lot of good data about long-term impact because it hasn't been around that long, right? But there have been a couple a couple things to point out. This is a World Health Organization slide, so just a couple of points that they make about based on worldwide data. We have a lot of data from other countries we like to look at. This is China, for example, Europe had waves before the United States. Acknowledging that most people have mild symptoms, don't even know they get infected, or have moderate disease, um, about 5% have become critically ill. And most people, and you can see this little, graph, little chart below, with mild disease, I'm pretty much feeling okay by two weeks after onset. In fact, that's one reason why people with illness, starting with symptom onset, uh, people are allowed to go back to work and all that in about 10 days uh, because of the fact that you can't culture virus out of people after nine days and um, and almost always completely recovered. Obviously, we want to see both. We want to see that good 10 days uh, from onset. We want to see people with no symptoms and they're allowed to go back to work. However, some people we know with severe disease especially can really go on for a longer course of illness. Um, however, more concerning than that, uh, most of us would probably be able to put up with six weeks of coughing and fatigue, but unfortunately, some people appear to have even a longer course. Next slide. So here's, a, here's, for example, sorry, this is a little bit of a medium term survey done by CDC um, about uh, people who tend to have longer uh, courses of illness. And this was a survey done by people about two to three weeks after they had tested positive. Uh, next slide. You can see here that a fairly high number of people, sorry, I hope it's not caught up at the bottom for you guys, it is a little bit for me, but about 50% um, about of patients on average, and you can see there that uh, had some lingering symptom at the time they interviewed. So two to three weeks out, they still had a cough or fatigue, headache, uh, diarrhea, et cetera. Again, this is uh, for most people not too worrisome as long as this eventually resolves. Uh, next uh, slide, please. However, what's becoming more clear, and this is from the journal Nature, um, is a recent news story just talking about this, this concept of long haulers or long term symptoms. Uh, and this is a quote from the, the story just trying to explain why some people seem to have long term effects. And just a reminder we say a respiratory virus, and we think, okay, there's some coughing, there's some lung problems, maybe a pneumonia. But this virus is showing uh, that it is much more than a respiratory disease, especially if people get severe illness. <coughs> It actually attacks other cells in the body. The ACE2 receptor that is in that, that the virus attacks is actually found on multiple cells of the body, not just lung cells. And it also appears to cause some immunosuppression, as other viruses have been known to do. So it appears that there are some growing case reports of people who have long, uh, long recoveries from this and maybe ultimately will decide have long-term health problems from it. Next slide. Just wanted to throw this up there since I was uh, looking for some stories about Eastern Idaho and I just stumbled across this. So um, this talks about a woman who has gone public and said that she is still struggling with long-term fatigue and other health problems after having recovered from COVID-19. Uh, next story, next slide. Um, so, okay, I just want to focus a little bit on Idaho data now. I hope most of you will go to our website. It's coronavirus.idaho.gov, and it has just been revamped to be a little quicker and easier to sort through and look through all our data. This is our current epi curve, and I just wanted to point out, right now I'm just showing you confirmed cases. So this is not even um, looking at the probable cases that are identified. These are all PCR confirmed cases. And you can see the red arrow there, I'm trying to point out that tail going up, which starting to see that rise, similar to what Jeff showed you in your health district as well. So statewide, we are starting to see case counts go up again. Next slide. 
These are hospitalization data, again, off of our website. These are the hospital data that they report directly into the federal system um, through uh, Teletracker. And if you might have heard this morning, there was big news because um, the federal government is going to really crack down on hospitals that are not reporting and potentially cut their Medicare uh, payments. Um, so very important. We're getting very good reporting right now in Idaho. Actually, most hospitals are doing a great job reporting every single day. This is very timely, reported directly by the hospitals. And the one above, I want to point out, this is number of people in the hospital. Um, so this is just your patient census with COVID. We have been seeing some nice declines since early August. We were feeling pretty good. But really, in the last few weeks, you can see that has, that has flattened out. We are no longer seeing a drop in people that are in the hospital. We're seeing that sort of start to flatten. And in our number of people in intensive care, which has hovered around 50-ish, uh, I'm hopeful that those last few days are a real positive sign, but as uh, that we are starting to see a drop in intensive care cases, but I'm not, I'm worried with our case numbers going up and with our hospitalization numbers starting to flatten or uh, not continue to decrease that our intensive care cases will go up as well again. At the bottom, um, you'll see by age group, as we talked about, this is total, this is not adjusted for age group. So you can see, even though we know that the older you are, the more severe the disease is, we just have more people in these younger age groups. So the, the, the largest represented group there are people in their 60s and 70s. Okay, next slide. And then among deaths, um, as, we, as we've talked about a couple of times, uh, people um, 80 and older are by far the highest risk of death. Um, and in Idaho, as of the nation, we see more men dying of this than women. And we also are happy to see that we don't seem to have a large race, uh, or I didn't show this in this slide, uh, but or ethnicity disparity in deaths. Our Hispanic, we have cases that are more frequent in Hispanic uh, population compared to the uh, non-Hispanic, but not among deaths. Uh, that is uh, actually proportional, fairly proportional, as is other as among other races. Uh, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to quick show you. This is my map. It's unofficial. I use this. I update this for myself to try to keep a track on what counties am I worried about. Um, I just wanted to highlight. You see a few epi curves I have in there to show you the type of things we're seeing. Green counties are counties in which right now I'm saying, okay, looks pretty good. You know, fewer than 10 per 10 cases per 100,000 over the last couple of weeks. So I feel like they're looking pretty good. Um, yellow counties are ones that are a little higher than that, but in my estimation are fairly stable, but we don't see a big increase going on right now. Uh, Ada and Canyon County, you'll see I'm calling them yellow right now. We're not seeing what back, uh, as you can see that at the curve from Ada County, we continue to see decreases in Ada County. Um, we'll talk later about this, but I think this is partly due to the mass order in place uh, in Ada County and in Boise City. Um, it's been it really nice declines here. Um, other parts of the state that are really struggling right now are really the southeastern part of the state. Um, you can see the Bryag, I believe Bonneville County up there is one of our counties that's really struggling right now, very high rates. Um, they have put various uh, orders into place, and it's really where I, I think uh, we've seen the most success so far in Teton County, where not only did the county put an order into place, but two cities uh, put orders into place. Uh, they actually each were able to turn around their, their rates of infection. They're, they're looking really good right now. Idaho County, I wanted to show you guys that to really make the point that that big spike there is uh, uh, a Cottonwood Correctional Facility has a large outbreak with over 100 cases. And so the county itself, uh, those cases get attributed to the county, if you will, but really in the general population, uh, the rates are really quite low. Um, and this is mostly um, confined to this uh, inmate population. But again, they have staff that go in and out of that, uh, of that facility that could spread it to the community. So we're very worried about that. Hey, a county and um, Previously, Washington County, although Washington County seems to be turning around, uh, Payette County continues to see high rates. Um, and, and that's pretty interesting because Malheur County, Oregon, also has very high rates. 
Um, so that's how things are looking this week in, in Idaho, as far as kind of where I'm seeing some of the, the trouble spots, if you will. Uh, next slide. I, this is my, I put unofficial at the bottom of this. Uh, if you can see the footnote, it's cut off on my screen, but I hope you can see that. I track the uh, orders that are currently in place that I'm aware of around the state. And you can see here, um, the blue counties or cities are areas that have put into some type of mask order, social distancing order, something is in place. The counties in green are orders are, are counties where there's been a resolution or recommendation by a health board. Uh, but not a not an order. So um, you can see there already mentioned that in southeastern Idaho, some of the counties have uh, orders in place. Um, Victor and Driggs still do, but Teton County does not. They lifted their order because of a turnaround in their in their case numbers. Um, okay, next slide. Just, this is to remind me to mention. I hope you all know this is up there on the State Department of Education website, a nice way to track different school districts. You can zoom in and get um, close-ups of all the different school districts and which ones are open for in-person, hybrid, online, closed, or are completely closed, which no school, school systems are right now in Idaho. And on the right-hand side, the charter schools, the same information. My kids, for example, are online only right now. Uh, they're in the Boise School District, uh, but uh, they just started opening up this week for the youngest kids and we are starting to bring the kids back. Uh, next slide. So a couple of thoughts about masks and face coverings, which I know is one of the things you guys will be talking about. Um, the, the, the million dollar question, of course, is do they work and what evidence is there that they work? Um, first of all, there is some laboratory evidence that is not perfect, but um, I'm going to leave aside the vast amount of evidence that is out there for surgical in general. In healthcare settings, there are there have been many, many studies, and I think I think that's not controversial for anybody. Nobody wants to have surgery and have the surgeon decide not to wear a mask. That is well accepted in um, throughout years and years of uh, lots of conditions and diseases that have been shown to be blocked by proper use of PPE in a healthcare setting. So I'm not gonna really even address that. Uh, but just a couple things that recently that have come out about uh, COVID in particular or cloth face coverings, because this is kind of a brave new world for us. One is that uh, the study in the upper right hand corner is from uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, just showing that uh, looking at a way of kind of track droplets and then showing that even at what they use was a slight, what they call a slightly damp washcloth. I'm not quite sure why I decided to use that type of cloth covering uh, because none of us are dampening our, our face coverings, but they just showed that that should have good protection and, and reduced the amount of droplets. Um, the second uh, set of there I'm mentioning because it did include coronaviruses, seasonal coronaviruses, and it just showed that um, they had people that were known to be infected. I thought it was a, a really interesting study, known to be infected with flu or a seasonal coronavirus, and then they had a, a surgical mask on, and they showed that you couldn't detect viruses through the mask. They tried to actually uh, culture these, uh, when these people were speaking, and showed that the mask blocked the virus from leaving, the, leaving their uh, face area with the mask on. And then I love the hamster study. They've done some really nice hamster stu studies that, <coughs> excuse me, you guys may have seen, uh, showing that it was a model in a laboratory setting of hamsters and using these sort of partitions that were meant to, uh, that were made out of surgical mask material, and they showed that if you put infected hamsters next to non-infected hamsters, having that material between them, not only did it prevent many of them from getting infected, it actually, uh, the ones that got infected got a, a milder piece of illness. And this will go, this will go into a little bit of, um, well, let me talk about that on the next slide, something about the additional benefit of masks. So let's just go to the next slide and then I can mention it there. So what's the, what's the real world evidence out there? It is weak um, compared to what we'd like to see. And if all of us would love to see a study where you took some people who masked them, you took others who didn't mask them and see who gets sick. Uh, but that's considered unethical right now because uh, the evidence is strong enough that masks will help. Uh, that it's considered unethical to do that gold, you know, gold standard study. What we do know is that a couple, couple things. One is that 
when we looked at when uh, researchers have, I should say, have looked at states that have put mask mandates into in effect, uh, there appear, there is a temporal decline in cases uh, that and that in the study that is shown there on the right, they compared it to states that did not do such orders and showed it seem to show benefit for the mask order. The other types of studies that I find that are really intriguing are the two studies that have been published that I'm aware of. One was an airplane, um, uh, a person who wore a mask while ill on an airplane. And they uh, did a really good job of trying to track back everybody that had been on that plane, were not able to show transmission. Doesn't prove anything, but it's, it's helpful to know that. The hair salon is even more interesting in a way, and this is in Missouri. Uh, two salon workers, and they only wore the cloth face coverings. They did not have surgical masks. And boy, you talk about being in your face. Um, you go to the hair salon, you got somebody breathing on you right next to you for an extended period of time. Um, Missouri did an extended uh, uh, contact investigation of these ill salon workers, and nobody uh, got infected because at that hair salon, uh, the, the customers and the uh, workers were required to wear face coverings. And I'll just mention, I don't have a slide on this, but I just want to mention that uh, there's also a growing theory, and this is supported by uh, experts, and it was just an editorial in journal medicine uh, from the University of California, San Francisco, that even if masks does not prevent you from getting infected completely, um, if you get a lower inoculum, if you're exposed to less virus, that you probably would get a milder illness. Um, and that concept has been shown to be true with other infectious diseases. And uh, so there's a theory that maybe that's one reason why we're seeing a lower mortality rate if people are masking or social distancing and they're getting potentially getting less of an exposure or less of an inoculum. Uh, maybe we're having more people get milder illness for that reason. So it's just a hypothesis. Um, we already talked about younger people getting, uh, getting infected, and that might mean uh, milder cases out there. Masking might mean milder cases because we're seeing uh, lower of the inoculum when people do get exposed. It might be a little bit of herd immunity developing. We don't think there's a lot of that out there yet in Idaho. Blood donor data is saying maybe 2-3% to of people have antibodies, at least among blood donors. Um, and then lastly, of course, we have better treatments. Um, so people that end up in the hospital um, are probably, uh, and we don't have this data yet for Idaho, but are probably uh, getting better treatment, they're getting remdesivir, they're getting oxygen, they're getting treatments that are in steroids uh, that are preventing deaths. Uh, so I think that's all, I can't remember, and I apologize, could you, uh, could you go to the next slide? I can't remember, I think it's my last slide. Okay. So yeah, so in conclusion, I wanted to mention a couple things. Uh, first of all, we were worried. Um, things looked pretty good even two weeks ago, but we're starting to see cases go up. We're worried. Flu season's coming, and we're very worried about hospital capacity. That right hand um, story there in my slide it just was came out yesterday um, from Southeastern Idaho. Uh, chief medical officer, of two hospitals have said that they are close to being overwhelmed by patients infected with the coronavirus. So we are seeing healthcare facilities in Idaho now, this is flu season hasn't even really started yet, that are saying that they are uh, potentially over, going to be overwhelmed. That is something we all want to avoid and we need to do everything we can to prevent. Kids are going back to school, um, universities and colleges are opening. We have had cases, clusters and outlook breaks linked to that. We are hoping by next Friday to have um, information about that posted on our web page. We're just working through how that would how that would look like. Uh, we need to make sure the schools understand what we're going to be posting. Uh, but we are seeing clusters and outbreaks, especially associated with um, sports teams, um, associated with uh, cheerleading, things like that. Um, schools have um, are doing what they can, uh, but we are worried about spread in school. Fall weather, we're all going back inside. I'm a big believer in UV light, and uh, it makes it easier to social distance. It makes it easier to blow off some steam block for a run instead of um, hanging out indoors. Uh, but it's getting colder and darker. And then, third, lastly, COVID fatigue. Uh, you know, we're all getting tired uh, of 
social distancing, staying at home, wearing our masks, and I just worry that people are losing their, going to lose their vigilance. So we're very concerned about what's in store for us for the fall. And my recommendation to wrap up is to maximize the use for you all to uh, to make recommendations, make guidance, make orders if that's what is needed to uh, maximize the use of cloth face coverings, masks to help reduce the transmission illness and to protect your hospital capacity. Um, so I think that's it. And um, I stand for any questions or I'm happy to stay while you guys have a conversation as well. Um, I think that's my very last slide. All right, uh, Jeff, we'll turn it back to you. Just uh, in closing, any any comments or questions from the board that you would still like to direct to to Jeff uh, with his presentation or anything from uh, Dr. Mon? Just one, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, um, Dr. Hahn uh, and Jeff, a Positive case isn't like the old days where you actually had to be sick to be a case. Now a positive case is a positive test. And I would maintain that the test itself uh, uh, doesn't seem to discriminate between symptomatic people and asymptomatic people, which is why the makers of the test say that no test should be considered positive without corroborating symptoms. Oh, I've been cut off. I didn't like what you were saying. It's <laughs> actually better. Okay. Dr. Hahn, did you hear the question? I may have lost sound. I think you lose your Okay, so I'll repeat the question to you and I'll put you on speakerphone. Um, the question is, um, in, in the case of COVID-19, the, uh, the criteria for a positive case is a positive test without evidence of, uh, of illness. Um, and that, uh, according to personal instructions, uh, uh, Jeff, we're back up. Okay. We back up, Jeff? Yes, ma'am. Okay, now hang up. <laughs> I did? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, I, I hear the question. I'm happy to, to answer. First, all, I'm sorry, I don't know who asked the question. If I can just... Dr. Uh, Banks. Alan Banks. Dr. Banks. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, a couple points about that. You know, when we do case definitions in epidemiology, we are not do making diagnoses like clinical. We're not, the, we're not acting as clinicians who are trying to diagnose an illness. We're trying to track a disease. And so I want you to know that we, we we totally understand the limits. I mean, we haven't even gotten started with the limitations of our testing situation. We have more and more antigen tests being done. We haven't really talked about that today, but those tests have even lower sensitivity. They even have some specificity problems we didn't anticipate. So that's one reason when I look at the severity of this epidemic and think about how we need to respond, case numbers are they're helpful, but they're not what I care about. Um, what I care about is the number of people that end up in the hospital with this disease, the number of people that end up dying of this disease, the number of people that end up with severe complications. I didn't mention that we've now had three children who've been hospitalized. Unfortunately, all have recovered and gone home, but that were hospitalized with that multi-system inflammatory condition, you know, of children. Um, so that's what we care about. So I agree with you. You know, you could, we we uh, have some of those cases that are counted are asymptomatic. Um, I'm not worried about that person and their health. They will probably be just fine, but it's really the impact on the community, their ability to transmit it. The asymptomatic people, as we talked about, there's some evidence that they might be worse transmitters because they're out. If they aren't wearing a mask, it's like Jeff made that point earlier. I'm not sure why there was confusion about it. I wear a mask every time I go outside. Why? Not because I'm sick, but because I'm not sick. So I don't want to accidentally 
uh, spread to somebody. If I'm infected, we don't know it. So that, that's why people need to wear masks as soon as they feel well. We know that they can be even worse uh, transmitters. They're going to go to the bars, they're going to go to the restaurants, etc. Yes, Dr. McLanders. Uh, Dr. McLanders, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, recent studies and the validity of those studies that 35 to 40 percent of people are asymptomatic. Um, and your comment on that, the validity of that, and then the impact again on the uh, communicability in the community. Yeah, thank you, Dr. McLanders. Yeah, so. You know, the, the percent of cases that are asymptomatic is we will never know that for sure until um, the studies get done that literally go through and screen large numbers of people, but randomly, right, in like a research way. Uh, because as I think, uh, I don't know, Dr. Banks, somebody asked this question earlier, the people getting tested in Idaho right now, we know that most of them go in for symptoms. Um, so we're not really getting a good feel for the asymptomatic number of people who are asymptomatic infected. In Idaho right now, only about 10% of our cases that test positive, only about 10% of those are asymptomatic. So most of our testing is people that are showing up and saying, I have a cough, I have a fever, we need to figure out what this is. So your 40% uh, is the number being, uh, because of the currently available data that's being quoted right now, but I'll tell you, we're seeing a lot higher percent asymptomatic in some of our populations, like the prison, the jails, um, they're having almost universal asymptomatic infections in that population, except you'll have a few people who get very, very sick, and, and they've even had someone die at the state facility down here, uh, one of the prisoners who, inmates who uh, died. So uh, that number is going to probably vary by population. In, in the cruise ships, um, they had a high rate of asymptomatic, and they thought that was because they masked up. Um, they, they, a cruise ship outbreaks the Diamond Princess, um, they actually had almost about 80% asymptomatic, and they believe part of that might have been they instructed all the, um, I want to call them inmates, they almost were inmates, the, uh, the cruisers uh, wore masks. So, so the rate of asymptomatic um, infection is probably directly related to age, directly related to whether uh, people are exposed to large amounts of virus. Okay. Uh Glenn Bailey has a question. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Hahn, I appreciate your presentation and your recommendations. My question for you is uh, in our in Cottonwood, for example, are the inmates there being required to wear a face mask? Yeah, uh, thank you, Glenn. I, uh, I have not to my understanding, yes. I, I am on a call weekly with the Department of Corrections to kind of work with them on how they're doing. I know that the facility here in the Boise and the Huna area, they did require them all to wear face coverings. I believe that's the case in Cottonwood. I am just kind of catching up to that outbreak a little bit, um, but I believe that is also the case there. I'm not positive though. Okay, but I would observe that despite wearing the face masks, those people were still getting COVID and it's a younger population for the most part that are recovering from COVID. And again, COVID is a threat to the population 75 and older, correct? Uh, I think it's a, I, they are certainly at higher risk. If you're, if you're trying to I think, I not think all of the evidence shows that. But that I definitely are, agree with you that 75 and older is at higher risk than younger people, yes. Yes. And our younger population, uh, elementary school up through high school, they're a very low threat population, correct? They're at low risk of severe disease, yes. Okay, absolutely. thank you. Just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, absolutely, agree with you, yeah. Uh, like you talked about, I'm just catching up with Cottonwood. I'm curious if and when they started requiring uh, cloth, I think it was cloth face coverings. Um, and it's gonna be kind of interesting to figure that out. But I think that that might be one reason why they're essentially um, almost all asymptomatic. If there is transmission, it appears to be not harming them very much. Thank you. And if you could confirm that though the number of cases spikes and goes up, 
and down trends um, that the number of deaths, the mortality rate, is not commensurate with that at this point over the last few weeks. Is that correct? Well, what I, you know, I did not uh, include this slide, and I can't, uh, I don't believe I can share my screen with you all. But if you look at the deaths, I didn't show the deaths in Idaho over time. We did have quite a few, quite a large number of deaths this fall. I, I hope you don't, I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that deaths are not happening. Uh, we had a small number of deaths in the spring wave. If you look at that as a percent of cases, the percent of cases, it is lower than it was in spring, absolutely. But we did have a large number of deaths this fall. We continue to, I look at death certificates, I look at every death certificate, because I think it's important for me to understand who's dying. And I saw two today already. We are having deaths. It's just not the same proportion uh, that we were seeing last spring. Correct. And, yeah. so, and that's being noted statewide, nationwide, and throughout the world, you see that the numbers may be increasing as we enter the fall and we're getting in closer and we've got schools reconvening, et cetera, but you don't see a commensurate rise in the death rate. Yes, it's sad that we do have deaths, but as I understand it from the Center of Disease Control, that the people who have died from COVID-19 without other comorbid issues is only 6% of those being noted on their death certificate as having COVID present when they die. So that's, Wait, I, I that doesn't- quit. I did not follow you on that, I'm sorry. Okay. The total death number in the United States is a little over 200,000. Of those deaths, CDC has said that only 6% of that 200,000 died solely of COVID-19. The so others all had- I think what you're saying- The others all had comorbidity issues. They had diabetes, they were overweight, they had lung disease, they had heart disease. In other words, those were the major contributing factors. Those who died solely of COVID-19 um, yeah, were 6%. Yeah, let me just address that. Um, and I, now I know what data you're talking about. Again, I look at death certificates every day. These are people that if it weren't for COVID would probably still be alive. Yes, they were obese, but they didn't die of their obesity. Yes, they had diabetes, but they didn't die from the diabetes. The diabetes contributed because we know people with diabetes or obesity or other things, they are more susceptible to severe illness and death. Uh, but if, if I'm overweight or obese and I get COVID uh, and die, that is not correct to say I just died from obesity. And I think that's what you're trying to turn this into. That is not what CDC is saying. They're saying that most people that die do have one of these underlying conditions, absolutely. But I don't think that should reassure us. Uh, many Idahoans are obese. Many Idahoans have diabetes. Many I Idahoans have underlying health conditions or have had a kidney transplant or one of these other conditions. Okay, thank you. And at this point, uh, they're working hard on vaccines. Do you have any further information on when that vaccine, I understand there's three primary vaccines, when one will be available to our highly at risk, older population, our medical staff, et cetera? Yeah, so I do. In fact, I'm on the advisory committee for immunization practices as a liaison member of the state from the state epidemiologist. So I, I am on all those calls. We, you may have heard we just had a meeting. Um, they have not yet formally voted, um, but everybody believes healthcare workers will probably be the first group recommended to receive the vaccine. Um, and there is hope that that will be as soon as November. Um, when there are not going to, there's not going to be a lot of vaccine available in November, probably, but, uh, and we don't know which one yet. Uh, you mentioned the three that are currently in clinical trials. 
um, and we don't actually have that data yet. And there's been no vaccine, as you know, authorized or licensed in the United States yet. So bringing it to the broader population, like people with diabetes, let's say, that is probably going to be months down the road after that. I think we'll be lucky if we have something for healthcare workers uh, before the end of the year. And, and highly unlikely, I think that we'll have a large amount of vaccine available this year, but nobody can say for sure. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hong, indeed, for taking your time, spending it with us here this afternoon. And also thank you, Jeff, for your uh, presentation. And do you have any closing comments? I don't. But thank you. Jim. All right. Thank you. We will we will bid farewell to both Jeff and to uh, Dr. Hong and at this point, uh, we've had an extensive discussion, uh, including masks. Is there any more discussion that you wish to comment on regarding uh, masks at this time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. does this mean we're on item 7? Uh, yes, sir. Well, in that case, Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> I think that the evidence as presented by the CDC in their 2020 paper where they had 14 randomized controlled trials of uh, masking among the general public and they found no benefit of masks to preventing the spread of influenza virus which of course uh, is what the studies were related to uh, the COVID-19 virus had not yet been uh, uh, on the horizon uh, when these 14 trials were done. Uh, but the CDC and the WHO that sponsored this uh, study uh, found no benefit to masks. And for that reason, I would move that we rescind our mask order for uh, 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 the uh, uh, population uh, in Coopie County. I would second the motion. All right, it's been moved and seconded that this be rescinded for the mask order for Kootenai County. Uh, is there a discussion? Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yes. Um, we, we have seen numerous studies and recommendations uh, saying that masks do help to keep the spread of the virus now. On the other hand, we've also seen numerous studies that indicate that masks are not that effective in controlling a virus such as COVID. My personal opinion is that they can be helpful and I will wear them around older folks and folks that I know have a higher risk due to obesity, uh, heart or lung conditions, etc. I will respect that. But at the same time, I do not think that local government should be requiring people to wear a face covering. I think that we can educate people and let people make the decision themselves. If they are at higher risks, then they should maintain the social distancing. They should ask people that come near them to wear a mask if they think that that will be beneficial to them. And I would respect that. And I think that most people in the population would respect that request. But I do not think that the local governments should be mandating that if you are outside and there's a possibility that you could come within six feet of other individuals that you must wear a face covering. That strikes to be violating our individual and personal rights and liberties, civil liberties. 
That's my opinion. That's why I would recommend that we rescind the mandate. But we continue to encourage people under certain conditions to wear a face covering. And if they want to go into businesses, I know that the, you know the big box stores are requiring their customers to wear a mask. I will honor that if I want to go and purchase an item at their store. But I do not think that it should be mandated by the local government or by the health districts. Educate people and let them make an educated decision. That's my recommendation. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Dr. Redmanders, you have the floor. I would agree with Glenn, certainly in terms of education. Um, I think um, we have already shown that, um, several months ago that uh, the county citizens were, after many, many uh, days and weeks of strong education efforts by our health district and uh, Kootenai Health as a, as a health institution, uh, in spite of that, High level of education, we were not seeing our citizens wearing masks. Second, we were seeing a large influx of people from the state of Washington who would come here because they could come and be, uh, going out to dinner or going to the little house, etc., without having to wear a mask. So, noting that, and then noting the presentation that Dr. Hahn made that, in fact, uh, there is evidence and certainly national and international recommendations that masking does reduce the incidence and certainly the incidence, incidence of uh, severe illness and death by virtue of the reducing number of cases. And then lastly, noting our own metrics, um, which are based upon the seven day rolling average the test positivity rate and the regional hospital occupancy, we are in our moderate range, just in our moderate range. Um, and we are seeing increased incidents with schools and with winter, fall, winter coming. And every expert in the country predicting that we're going to see an, an increased incidence. With those factors, I would be not in favor of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, from uh, on the screen, uh, Jay Nelson, do you have a comment on the motion? Um, I do, Chairman. Thank you. Um, I just, you know, I'm I'm really grateful to um, the citizens in our community that are wearing masks. Um, and I think Dr. McLanders is correct. We need community engagement. Um, we need to continue to educate the public. That's our job. That's part of our role being on the health board. But, you know, I'm optimistic in that I, I think the mask order has made a difference in Kootenai County, and I think it continues to do so. Um, right next door over the state line in Washington, um, there has been an increase, as well as you're seeing an uptick in, in our local numbers. So um, that is a concern if those citizens come over our way. Um, you know, we need to continue the mask wearing. Um, you know, we're not at the mercy of this virus. We don't have to be. We have an action plan. Um, we need to wear masks and socially distance and use hand hygiene. Um, keep chasing this pandemic, and I want all of us to get out in front of it and be proactive. And again, as a health board, we're here, um, not for ourselves, but to serve the citizens and all the citizens, all age groups, everyone with a comorbidity, everyone at risk and everyone not at risk. Um, we need to stay the course. Uh, we need to continue to follow our legal mandate in Idaho code um, to do all things, to preserve and protect public health and to do preventative health. And, um, you know, in, in North Idaho, in this community, we're not safe until we're all safe. Um, 
and there's many myths circulating about the masks. Um, but I've read many studies and I've heard they are effective. Um, but when one person is wearing a mask, up to 50% effective, and when two people are wearing a mask, 90% um, or greater effectiveness. And um, Dr. Banks mentioned the flu. Um, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, what I've been reading about, um, in Australia, in their peak season, they usually have an average of 22,000 cases of the flu, and they reported 85 cases. Dramatic, dramatic difference. In Chile, in, the, in July, in their peak two weeks of flu season, they recorded zero cases. Uh, same with Argentina, uh, South Africa, they're seeing staggering low numbers of flu. And uh, anecdotally, they're relating that to, again, the hand hygiene, the social distancing, and the mask wearing. So again, I'm, I'm optimistic about our flu season. Um, if we continue down this road, um, that we won't see the peak the, due to the flu. Um, in Colorado, they did a couple studies um, where there was a mask mandate and where it was not enforced. Uh, they had at least 20% increase in mask wearing. So I think an order is effective. It tells the public, it sends a message. Uh, we want to protect each other. Um, wearing a mask, when I wear a mask, which I do at all times when I'm out and about, it's not about me. It's about protecting everyone I see, my family, my coworkers, my patients. Um, it's about protecting them. So based on, um, you know, we all received a letter from the Idaho Academy of Family Physicians um, supporting our mask mandate along with um, many other Lost to Jay. Thank God. The mask mandate is beneficial. Um, in fact, to our letter of the Idaho Academy of Family Physicians, in there it says the science is very clear masks reduce the spread of COVID 19 by upwards of 85%. It doesn't say where they're um, getting their data, but it is in there. And then of concern is our metrics that we're, we're bumping right up against our moderate level right now today based on just um, cases and um, positivity rate. So that's concerning. And then what Dr. Hahn presented about, um, you know, it's fall, it's flu season, it's school. We are getting some fatigue. Um, we need to continue to be vigilant. We need to continue to support each other um, and motivate each other. And again, get out in front of this pandemic. Um, and get through this together as a community with a sense of humanity and caring about each other um, and wearing masks, um, I think is one of the best ways where we can keep everyone safe. So I do not support the, the motion. Commissioner Fitzgerald, you have an opportunity to comment if you wish. No additional comments, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any other uh, comments from board members on the, the motion, Glenn? Did I see your hand? Um, Mr. Chairman, I also believe that the, the concept of herd immunity is very real. And that, you know, this virus is going to run its course and people need to make precautions if they have comorbidities and issues that would make them more susceptible. Um, no, I, I understand their concerns and I'll respect their wishes, but at the same time, you know, we've got to continue school. We've got to continue meeting together in our religious organizations. We've got to continue doing that. We can't let this COVID control our lives and make us wear a mask so that we can't see the facial expressions of those that are teaching our, us, our children that are communicating. It, it's, I think it's detrimental mentally, emotionally to our children to be walking around with a mask on, to be dealing with people in masks. You know, that, yeah, it's an emotional thing. But 
That's the way I feel. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Dr. Mack. Yeah. One last comment. I have said repeatedly from the beginning that um, <clears throat> the PCR test uh, is not <clears throat> a good test for a diagnosis of disease. The developer of PCR, uh, Dr. Kerry Mollis, a Nobel Prize winner, said it should not be used for diagnosis of disease. I can go into great detail about why this test is faulty, but it would be over the head of most of the audience here, and for that reason, I won't do so. But what I will do is cite the CDC statistics on the death rate from this disease, which is lower than for influenza. And uh, uh, if you're under the age of 70, you have a 99.998% chance of surviving COVID-19. Any other uh, comment? I'll call for a roll call vote on this motion. I may. Uh, Secretary Cowley, Glenn Bailey, your vote on this motion? I vote to rescind. Okay, that would be a, uh, a yes vote. Vote in favor of the motion. Yes. Correct. So we're clear what a, what a yes means and what a no means. Correct. A yes means that you're in favor of the motion made by Dr. Banks, and a no means that you are against the motion. All right, so we, we tally Glenn Bailey's vote. Uh, Mike Fitzgerald, how do you vote? No. Uh, Dr. McLandris? No. Uh, Dr. Banks? Uh, yes. Uh, Jenny Nelson? No. And the, uh, the chair votes no. But in this case, the, my vote is a no. Substance uh, without my vote, the, uh, the motion does not pass. Did I call for your vote? I'm sorry. Did I, I did call for your vote. Yeah. Okay. All right. The motion fails. And we uh, will go on then with our uh, agenda. We have an epidemic, and the epidemic is cowardice. No, they want to keep it with your place. Cowardice. You're all cowards. No, Not you. Coward men. Men. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of people that, that agree with you. I'm sorry, ma'am. You. You're out of order. I don't even. Journey wins. For now. Will you judge? Joe Regallo is the uh, division administrator for the environmental health, and he will introduce our next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Eric Kettner is uh, our manager of the environmental health section, and he is here today to explain, uh, hopefully not too complicated, two items for your consideration today on the agenda, which are two of our fees that are charged in the environmental section. One is a renewal fee uh, to renew a second grant, and the other one is a rarely used uh, fee which is the permit for a large soil absorption system. And in plain people's terms, that's a large septic system that's just before you have to go to the public sewer uh, type system. Eric, without further ado. Thanks, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, board members. Um, as Joe stated, I'm 
here to present to you and, and request for your consideration, um, review and, and approval of, of two fee reductions for two of the services that we provide in the environmental health section. The, uh, we do regularly analyze our fees against our costs and our staff time so that we are, uh, what we're charging is aligned with, with our actual cost of doing business. In this most recent analysis, um, it was determined that, that our cost of renewal fee that's currently $100 should be reduced to $50. Um, we believe the reason for that is largely um, some level of automation and frankly the way we we've altered how we handle those renewals and just for your clarification the cost of fifty dollars is not simply the cost of someone handing us a check to renew the application we actually go to substantial effort we make hundreds of calls a year letting people know that their permit is about to expire or their application is about to expire um, so that they're not stuck paying the whole fee all over again so um, that one is pretty straightforward um, improvements in operations have really driven that, that cost down. Uh, the other fee is the large soil absorption system fee. As Joe stated, that's frankly, it's very rare. We've had two of those in the past five years. Um, there was a, a fee matrix that was set up before that was based on gallonage, but frankly, in analyzing that, um, first off, we don't have a lot of data points, but secondly, um, the amount of time that it takes is not dictated by the number of gallons. It's dictated about by the number of amount of time on the site. Um, and so what we've, we've looked at what other districts are doing and frankly, the $1,000 up front fee and then $60 for um, on-site time is gonna actually more accurate than capture the time spent working on those permits. That is frankly all I've got. Eric, I, and I, I appreciate the lowering of fees, and I think it's justified based on your analysis and discussion. Uh, I concur completely. Um, my question is, okay, it, does this start now because you're going to have people who receive the permits at the higher rate coming and requesting a refund? Uh, so what's, how, how will you administer that? At this point, if the fee, if the permit's been issued, the systems installed, we're going to consider those having been done under the previous fee schedule. Okay. We don't have any current active applications at this time. So it's from this point forward. From this point, if we, and frankly, if we had any active applications, we would, we would certainly consider making the fee retroactive. But at this point, we don't have any. Understood. So okay. Question, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Dr. Banks. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Ketner. Um, uh, a renewal fee. Now, what exactly is a renewal fee? The the Idaho Subsurface Sewage Disposal Rules, in the rule, it states that an application or a permit is only valid for one year. Um, and so, by rule, they have to renew prior to the expiration date. We have tried different tacks over the past, having late fee or different other methods, but EDQ has said that, no, you shall follow the letter of the law, you shall require a renewal. Um, and so we created a process to try to minimize um, the number of times people have to renew by calling them and we say, look, put the system in the ground and move on. You know, at, you know so we're trying to, to get those systems installed so they're not carrying over for- Okay, years. because, because I, I, I wasn't clear what renewal meant because there are people whose septic system needs to be repaired, and that's oh. different. That's a yes. repair yes. Uh, permit. Yeah, these are essentially open applications or you know, incomplete applications. Until it's inspected and approved, and then it's closed. It's, yes, it's closed now. Okay. Okay, and, and the, the other, the large soil absorption system permit, um, can you give an example of that? Um, I, I, I actually thought about this a little bit. Um, a, a typical example, there, there's actually a number of them in Bonner County, to be honest with you, probably more than, than anywhere else. Um, they typically, if, if someone wants to develop 10 or 15 lots, typically they're in residential, and there's only one good place to put a septic system because they're all waterfront lots, they'll take the, the drain field and they'll put it on the area that meets all the setbacks. 
and then everybody will connect to that system. The challenge with, with those systems is because they are essentially point loading so much more wastewater, the EQ has greater requirements on setbacks, sizing, design. So there's an engineering component, there's a hydrogeological component. So administratively, they're much more time consuming than a standard permit. I see. That old system is very expensive. To <laughs> yeah, the example that we placed in your packet, um, if there were 30 lots under the current rule, we would anticipate a charge of somewhere over $18,000 to the developer to develop those 30 lots using the current rubric. By changing it to this, we would anticipate that same project would come in somewhere in the neighborhood of $3,400. So it's a substantial reduction in the cost to that person to put in an LSAS, which we would want them to put in rather than trying have individual systems that you know, that's designed and engineered. So there's a what I'll call an inherent incentive um, for the developer to use the LSAS system and a decrease in the cost to do that. We do these as Eric said in five years we've had two. Um, so there's not a great burden on us and you would be paying for the field time at $60 an hour which means that from the when, when just to be clear, that means when our EHS person arrives on your property, we're not going to charge you because they have to drive an hour and a half. That's not part of the, of the field fee. Just on site time. On site time. Dr. McClendon. Eric, can you um, describe regarding the large soil absorption systems and our leadership to protect the aquifer? So, are there different rules regarding large soil absorption? system over the aquifer is defined versus not over the aquifer. Yes, yes, there are. It's by the EQ it's designed to defined as a as a sensitive resource aquifer and non-degradation. Um, and then that's where it gets into the hydrogeological study. If someone was to propose an, an LSAS over the aquifer, it likely would not pass a, 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 such a study and therefore would not we would not be able to permit it because it wouldn't make it through that evaluation process. So does DEQ have that control? They have control over evaluating the hydrogeologic study. We also ask them to do um, um, a complimentary review of the engineering because these systems are large enough that they are pressurized and they tend to be more complicated. So. And just parenthetically, ultimately DEQ's the one that has the authority, they delegate it to the health district. So it's always their authority. We're just, we're just following their rules. Yeah. Right. It's, a, it's a collaborative process to getting these permitted. So the, for the purpose of the record regarding Post Falls, the microscope, and then North or West Hayden, are those developments tied into the sewer systems of those cities? Yes. Correct. Yes. The, the, the major developments are. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I could make a motion. Unless I'm I think, I think we'll have to start it too. I didn't hear that. I'm way down here. Oh, go ahead. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we amend the fees of the Panhandle Health District to lower the septic permit renewal fee to be $50 from the current amount of $100. Furthermore, I move that we amend the fees of the Panhandle Health District to set the fee for large soil absorption system permits uh, that it be changed to a flat fee. $1,000 plus the fee of $60 per hour of field inspection time. Second, Mr. All right. Second, Dr. McLeander. Second, that that. Any more discussion? You pretty well heard the ins and outs of it. Yes. Just a, a point of order that would become effective immediately. All right. All right. I don't agree to that. You would agree. Effective immediately as a secretary. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. And I I heard an aye from Jay. Did I hear your vote, Mike? He's muted. Yes, Mr. Commissioner. Aye. Okay, thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.
Then let's uh, move on. How far away is uh, is Christine? Uh, Christine, are you? Um... Here she is, okay. walking in the door. Okay, Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're reporting on the two months ending August 31st for fiscal year 21. Our ending cash balance at the end of August is $4,574,000. This is an increase of $1,184,000 over our June ending balance. This balance gives us 4.95 months in reserves before board committed funds and program restricted funds. Board committed funds are 317,000, program restricted funds are 412,000. After subtracting those two items, we have 4.18 months in reserve. Moving on to the budget to actual, Consolidated version again for the two months ending August 31st. Our total revenue for the two months $2,769,000. Currently, it's over budget by $287,000. Personnel expenditures $1,366,000. Over budget by 1000 Total operating expenses for the two months ending, $422,900. We're under budget by $87,000. Total expenditures, $55,600. Under budget by $42,000. Currently, this $55,000 only represents the principal payments on the loans. Trustee benefit payments, we're at $2,100. We're over budget by $1,700. Total expenditures for the two months, $1,847,000, which gives us an excess of $922,600. We take our excess, plus our adjustment for accounts receivable, add that to our beginning cash balance, brings us back to our cash balance as of August 31st of 4574000 Are there any questions? Question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Dr. Bank. Um, 
Christine, if I understand the timing of payments to the health district from the state and so on, part of this disparity, this excess uh, uh, balance is due to uh, a payment that was recently made, which will then over time be absorbed by the operations of the district. Is that correct? Part of the increase is is if you see the cash balance, that increase of 1.9 million, the majority of that is made up of the first half of the state of state appropriation, which was six hundred and forty-three thousand dollars. And then we also received a large payment in July from June AR billings. So that got into the cash balance also part of that access. So yes, it does go to timing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, this this may tie in with, with Dr. Mack's question. I, I think it has to be. When you talk about on, the, on your uh, highlight page about the 4.16 months of cash reserves, is that is that kind of what you were thinking about too in, in your question? the amount of reserves we currently have. You and I are on the same page, Mr. Chairman. We are. <laughs> okay. Well, then, Christine, can you, can you reach out in the future, let's say in two or three months, and just give us a, a, a rough guesstimate? I guess where I'm going is, uh, I doubt if we would need to have a 4.16 months in reserves month after month after month. We have several things that we need to discuss in our upcoming meetings, either in October or November. Okay. We All need right. to be doing a budget revision because our current budget since it was developed so early on in the spring, it does not include any of the COVID expenditures. So we need to adjust our budget to reflect any COVID okay. activity. The other thing that also needs to be taken into account is we have received several large grants that uh, will increase our revenue. And the offset, of course, is going to be an increase in expenditures. So that will also have to be included in the new budget. Okay. The other thing that has also occurred is uh, that will feed into the amended budget is a significant change in personnel related to COVID. So those are all items that, that we need to uh, factor into our amended budget. Okay. The other thing that also occurred in January was a 5% revision or reversion to the state appropriation where we paid back approximately $64,000 so our next one half will only be about six six hundred thousand dollars for the second half of the appropriation. So there's a lot of changes going on, um, and a lot for us to talk about. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Hello. Christine, could you address the timing in the fiscal years of the the, the first COVID grant monies that we received? Early on, we started this whole response effort with no funding. Then DHW came through with $360,000. And I believe that became effective in about April, if I remember correctly. We quickly expended that award. That's $360,000. Then in late May, early June, we received an, an amendment to our NEDS contract. And that amount was $275,000. And we quickly expended that. Currently, we have a COVID ELC. And 
I didn't bring, uh, let's see, ELC, laboratory capacity. I can't remember the E. Enhanced, enhanced laboratory capacity funding. And that is through the CDC. And that amount is 1,209,000, of which we also anticipate an amendment to come probably within the next 60 days of approximately 3.6 million. Also available to us is CARES funding through Idaho Rebounds. That's CARES Act money. And this is an estimate because it was based on budget numbers presented to the state very early. So based on the budget that we submitted to the Division of Financial Management for personnel costs, unrelated to contract, contract tracing for personnel costs, we budgeted 1,278,000. For contact tracing, we submitted a budget of 1,072,000. And then, assuming we went through those funds, FEMA is available to us but FEMA is a funder of last resort. So currently, what we have available to us, not including the ELC amendment, is $4.5 million. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. And certainly, um, it, it, this is a, it, it's not money, some of it we have, and, but it's based on our actual expenditure. Not that they send it. To. Is that to my correct there, Christine? Correct. These are all cost reimbursement. cost reimbursement. We do not have these funds in hand. We expend them and then we submit for reimbursement. So these are all things, Mr. Chairman, that are, are factoring into uh, the budget revision that Christine is going to present to us um, sometime, either if we choose to have an October meeting or at our November meeting should the board so choose, but it is time that we revise the budget to reflect what's been going on with COVID. Actual condition. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, some, so sometime between now and the end of the year, we can expect a budget revision. Okay. My next question, and then I, okay, I got down here to the bottom of this one, the first page you presented to the end of the period where four million five hundred seventy-four thousand one hundred three. okay? Then you bring that number over here to the fiscal year 2021 column. And so that's the second entry in, in the uh, fiscal 21 column. So we have two numbers in that column and we come down to the bottom of that column or it has the $779,487. I, I got, I, you lost me there. Can, can you please raise that so I can see what you're looking at? And it's listed as an average. And when you take those two numbers and average them, they don't come out in our estimation to the $779,487. See what we're talking about. Where are you seeing the 700? I'll show you. Where is the bottom? Oh. Okay. Um, that is not a correct average. That is not a correct average. Okay. Well, uh, um, actually, you don't have to tell us what it is. <laughs> Now, that number is not correct, but uh, the 4.95 is and the 4.16 is. So it'd be the average of those? Yes. Okay. That's all you can go proceed. Well, I have one thing before concluding, which is a fun tidbit, good information, something that you rarely see. As you're aware, we have a loan on this facility. Yes. And the loan rate resets every five years. 
and the loan rate at the end of June was 1.42%. It reset. Our loan rate for the next five years on $1.7 million is 0%. Wow. You're serious. <laughs> I'm serious. If you recall, there was an error yes. when our loan was done in our favor. The loan was made at the bank rate at their cost. There was no margin added to it. So with interest rates dropping, there was an adjustment to our rate, which reset it to 0%. So that's something else as we develop our, our budget revision. Um, we may want to discuss how we deal with that, especially over the next five years. Oh. I do have some ideas. Oh, I, I, I have an idea too. <laughs> Let, let's uh, let's uh, develop a program that we can have it paid off within the next five years. You're on, you're on the same page as I am. <laughs> as I'm sure we all are. <laughs> Okay. okay, go ahead. Well, if there are no further questions, this concludes my report. Okay. Great job. Thank you. Any, any comments or questions from any of you on the finance report? Uh, Be interesting to know uh, in a few years how how much money this is actually saving us. Depends depends on how how quickly we pay it off. Good, but uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let's. Hear what our director has to say. Laura, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, our November meeting, which is our next regularly scheduled meeting, um, uh, 19 November, is our 2020 legislative update, um, followed by our board meeting. As you um, all uh, are aware, annually we hold a legislative update meeting, um, uh, generally speaking, in November. Uh, so, certainly, I'm sure. Um, there'll be lots of topics that our legislators are interested in, um, and um, we'll begin that at 11. If there's something you would like uh, us to specifically address with the legislators, as well as the county commissioners are invited, um, uh, please do let me know. Um, and then my next question for you, um, certainly we do not have um, a meeting scheduled in October. Uh, I'm happy to schedule the meeting in October. It is certainly at your um, um, if, if you would um, like to discuss that. That meeting then would be um, the fourth Thursday, um, so 22 October, if you would like to have that meeting, and followed by our 19 November meeting, which would be one, two, three, four weeks from then. Well, comments from the board or questions about an October meeting? How do we... How do we determine whether we really need it or not? It'd be an opportunity to address the revised budget. If as the primary okay. issue that we would be dealing with, then we wouldn't have to deal with that during your legislative time frame. That's what I'm okay. just a thought. Yeah, good thought. Any other comments from the board? Sounds like the consensus uh, is that uh, we will schedule uh, our next meeting, the 22nd of October, and ask Christine to come up with her budget proposal. That's proposal for my budget. All right, we'll do that, that sir. Sound reasonable for everyone. Okay, and then I just wanted to touch on um, some of the suicide prevention work, and I really want to point out um, the uh, true champion in this room for suicide prevention as Dale Ainsworth. Sitting silently over there. Jill has just um, taken on um, so much in the 
the realm of suicide prevention. Um, we um, canceled our walk this year um, due to COVID, um, but we did um, um, some of the, we did some other things during suicide prevention week, which was a couple of weeks ago. Um, one of them was bringing Carla Klein, who is a um, via Zoom, who is a, uh, she wrote, wrote the book No Time to Say Goodbye. Um, has been here twice. Uh, lost her husband to suicide, and, and really helps those um, in, in a way that is truly amazing. I've seen her at work um, uh, in, in helping those that have lost a loved one to suicide. Um, how 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 they can cope. Um, also QPR. Jill has just um, uh, been providing virtual QPR, going to locations, um, providing QPR. Um, Dr. Joyner, um, we, we're going to bring him here. He wrote a, a book called Why People Die by Suicide, um, an incredible book. Um, he lost his father to suicide. He's a physician out of Florida. Um, we were uh, going to have him in here in September as, as was a, a group in Pocatello. Rather than, because everything's virtual, we just kind of promoted him through the District 7 so we didn't have to um, pay to have him come. Um, and that was well, very well attended. Um, and so many other things going on, mental health, first aid, uh, that Jill has, has arranged, um, as well as the, the work at the gun shows um, to um, um, encourage safe storage um, and lethal means. Um, so I just really want to acknowledge um, Jill um, for her work in suicide prevention. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, my report is complete. Any questions, any comments you have for our director? Just comment, thank you, Jill. Okay, that concludes then the director's report. The next item on our agenda is an executive session. I would call for a motion to go into executive session under the number listed here is code 74 206 section F to communicate with legal counsel for public agency to discuss the legal ramifications of the special letter we have. Mr. Chairman, uh, this time I make a motion we go into executive session under 74 206 subparagraph F to communicate with legal counsel for the public agency to discuss the legal ramifications of and legal options for pending litigation. All right, uh, you have heard the the motion, uh, roll call vote, Dr. McLandris? Yes. Uh, second. Be seconded. Oh, do you think it should be seconded? Well, let's do that then. <laughs> We'll still do a roll call vote. Dr. McLanders. Well, also vote against. Uh, Commissioner Fitzgerald? Yes. Jay Nelson? Yes. Ren Bailey? Yes. Dr. Banks? Yes. And I vote yes. We are in executive session. I would say to our guests, thank you for coming. Uh,